Well, <clears throat> welcome to 40 Days in the Word. Today we officially start 40 Days in the Word, so um, I'm hoping that you really kind of lean into this and take advantage of every opportunity because what I've found in life is that if you don't grab it while it's there, it just can end up being one of those things that you're going to do, you're going to do, and never get round to doing and, uh, and, and, you know, I know I'm not alone in that, that so often we have our to-do list, we have things that we want to do, but unless we actually spend some, you know, we actually give it the time, it's in our diary, it's, uh, it, 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 you know, it's scheduled in, it never happens. So over these next six weeks, we are going to spend some time learning together about, uh, about the Word of God and what it means to us. And so uh, our small groups, as I've said uh, and I do say as often as I can, our small groups are integral to us as a church. They are the most important part of us as a church. And, um, <clears throat> and so being part of a small group is what really, really matters to us. Thank you. I left it on my desk, so I'm not very organized, am I? Um, and so our small groups are really uh, important to us. And, uh, and that's where you can build friendships. That's where um, we're able to do some of those things that we talked about last week. Can you remember which one it was that affects in our small groups where we can live there out? Yes? See if you can remember them. Yes? The first one was to listen, to receive the Word of God by listening to it, wasn't it? Then it was to use our eyes to read the Word of God, wasn't it? And then it was to research using our hands and mouth, wasn't it? So in other words, your hands, because you've got to write it down, uh, what you're learning, and of course, through your mouth, because we discuss it in our small groups. Is that all right? Yes. And the fourth one, can you remember what that was? Was to reflect and remember with your mind. And the last one was to respond with your actions. That's right. Well done. Um, so it is important for us to, uh, to be in a small group because without it, we're not going to have that opportunity uh, to discuss what God is, uh, is saying to us. Um, and I, I just believe that that's so important to us. Well, <clears throat> tomorrow you should receive your first devotional. And, um, and from that, um, we will commence. Yes, and of course, for some of you, maybe you meet on a Monday Connect group. Can I just say, though, on Connect groups, for those of you that meet on Monday, this is probably the month where you really need to change the night that you're on, because you've got three bank holidays. And what I find is rather, um, think is for those that have them on a Monday, is is that they regularly miss their small group meeting because there's a bank holiday on. So that would be good to change, particularly for this one. Yes. Um, if you're able to do, to change, change the night. Um, just because we always have two in May anyway, don't we? We have the first Monday in May and the, the last one. But of course, we've got the King's Coronation this, uh, this time as well. So it's, um, you're, you're never going to go to your connect group if you're on a Monday. Um, don't say that because then everybody else will be on a Monday going, we get more holidays. <laughs> um, but let me just say that the Bible is, um, is the most read book in history. There is no book that can come anywhere near as close to the Bible um, for being read. It is the best-selling book in history. It is so much of a bestseller that in actual fact, when they go through best-selling books... They can't name the Bible because it would be number one, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, century in, century out. It is the most best-selling, and it's not on top of that, it is the most translated book in history. 
There is history, it is being translated, even as we speak, into new languages. There are people who have the call of God in their life, they're good with languages, they learn new languages, they go to unreached people's groups, and they, they translate the Bible into their language. Isn't that phenomenal? And so, in other words, the Bible changes history. It is a phenomenal book on that. But we need to understand that it is not just a phenomenal book in terms of the records that it has broken. It is mostly important to us because it is the Word of God, because it is God's Word to us. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 and 17 says this, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. All scripture is God breathed. That's so important to us. The word in Greek um, is uh, theonoustos. Theo yes. Theo meaning God and uh, neustos, it starts with a P. So I've just, I've got to remember to not say the P. Neustos meaning breathed. Uh, the spirit in, in the New Testament often is referred to as the pneuma. It's the spirit of God, yes? Or in the Old Testament, it's ruach, which is the breath of God. And, um, and so uh, what's important to, for us is to understand that this word is God breathed. For us to understand that is, is that the only reason that I can speak, the only reason you can hear the words that I speak is because of my breath. If I had no breath, I would not be able to speak. So my words reflect my breath, yes? It is the air coming up from my lungs and it is going past my vocal cords which are vibrating at a phenomenal rate just for you this morning so that you can hear the words that are coming out. So in other words, the words of Jonathan Harris is the breath of Jonathan Harris. The breath of Jonathan Harris is the words of Jonathan Harris. So when we say the word of God is God breathed, we are saying that they are the words words of God. Amen. So that's Psalm 119 verse 86 says, tells us this, all of your commands can be trusted. In other words, everything in the Bible can be trusted. Now that's a big claim, isn't it? That's a massive claim, yes, that you can trust the Bible. So how can we know that we can trust the Bible? That's the question for this morning that I want to go through, and I'm going to give you seven reasons. The first one, it is historically accurate. It's not just doctrinally or theologically or ethically or morally accurate. Yes, it's not just good teaching, as it were. <coughs> it is true history. It is a book of History. It is real people, real places, in real time, doing real things. It's not fictitious. It's not made up, yes? Now, why is this important? This is important for the simple reason that God cannot lie. So if you ask me, is there anything that God cannot do? Well, yes, there is. God cannot lie. Lie. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 says this, it is impossible for God to lie because God is truth. Yes? So in other words, if there's a lie in this book, yes, then God is not who he says he is. It is not a book of God if there's any lies in it. So Psalm 33 and verse 4 says this, the word of the Lord is right and true. It's not only true about salvation, it's true about history, yes? And so one of the ways that we can test whether something is good history is through eyewitness accounts. That's what historians look at. They say, okay, is this, did this person do that? Were they there at the time when it happened? Did they see it with their own eyes? 
or did they hear someone else tell them about it? And sometimes that we are taking history from something where it's three or four uh, stages down the line before history is documented. And sometimes it's history that we understand as history and we would not probably query as history, but can be thousands of years before it was actually recorded. Where with the Bible, it is primarily a book of eyewitness accounts. It's about the people that were there, that saw it, that wrote it down. Yes, Moses was there when the Red Sea split. Joshua was there when the walls fell down of Jericho. The disciples were there in the upper room when they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. They weren't just hearing about it, they saw it. Matthew was there and he wrote it down. John was there and he wrote it down. Peter was there and he told Mark and Mark wrote it down. Amen. So this is how, I'll put my glasses on, might slow me down. <coughs> Luke, Luke as we can see, he talked to all of them, and including Jesus' mother, and he wrote it down. So we have eyewitnesses' accounts of the actual events as they happened. And I believe this is so important. Now, of course, there are some people who just say, ah, well, <clears throat> the Bible might have been written down, but it's, it's not very accurate. I want to tell you it's one of the most accurate books around, yes, uh, that has ever been done because of the care and the attention that is given to the copying of the texts. It's unbelievable. If you're on Alpha, you will see some of that done by a world expert on this. But the Old Testament copyists, the scribes who would write these scrolls out, they would do it like a photocopy. They would do it letter by letter. In fact, there was a long list of rules that they had to keep in order for a copy to be validified, yes? In other words, each copy would have a select number of columns. Their numbers would have a certain length that they had either 48 to 60 in length. It would always be exact number of 30 letters wide, and so they could always check it out. It had to be copied letter by letter, not word by word, so there was no mistakes on that one. So in other words, if they knew how many letters um, of the alphabet were in each book, they would write it down. So let's say, for example, the first letter, Aleph, they would say, okay, they know there's 1,633 in this book, so they would count them is there 1,633. If they came to 1,634, they threw it away. So it was always known. In fact, they used to know the middle letter of the first five books uh, of, the, of the Bible. They would know the middle, middle letter of the Old Testament. They would count forward and they would count backward from that letter. And if it didn't come exactly as they said it would, they would throw it away and start again. Now, is that not motivation to get it right in the first place? <laughs> yes, maybe. Yes. Now, we can see this accuracy through the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The very famous are the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were written about 100 years before Jesus, and they included copies of all the Old Testament books except Esther. The earliest copies we had before this discovery were 900 years before Christ. Yeah, sorry, 900 years after Christ. In other words, there was a thousand year gap. Now, let me ask you, how much change do you think in those thousand years of copying and copying and copying would you expect there to be in some of the manuscripts? Well, I want to tell you that the, 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 the errors that they were found was to be um, a, a maximum of 5% in that. And that was mainly all the spelling of names. Another proof is in archaeology. Another proof is in archaeology. Archaeology has proved again and again that the people and the places in the Bible are accurate. You can go find these places now. We've dug them up. The Aropogos, where Paul was. The theater in Athens. The pool of Siloam, where the blind man was healed. Portions of Herod's temple are there. The book of Acts is all about historical accuracy. It's written by Luke, who is a historian and a doctor. He talks about 54 cities in 39 countries and nine different islands. It is completely historical. 
Historians at times have thought the Bible wasn't true because they didn't believe what was written there. They thought, no, that didn't happen, that couldn't be. So, for example, for a long time, they said there's been no such guy as Solomon because if this guy Solomon existed, um, then he must have had camels, he wouldn't have had horses. And so this, uh, this was uh, what, the, what they said for many, many uh, years. Until, of course, there was the discovery of Megiddo, and they discovered one of Solomon's chariot cities with a thousand of stables for horses. So again, the Bible was proved right. And what about the example of the empire of Hittites, which they talked about, said there was nowhere else, but in the Bible, was it ever referred to? Yeah, but in the early 1900s, Professor Hugo Winkler discovered at, uh, at a bogus car, what, uh, 10,000 clay tablets at the capital of the Hittites and now I want to say, now everyone believes in the Hittites. So what I'm trying to say to you is, if you want to go to where the truth is, you go to the Word of God. It's in there every time. They think, oh, no, it's not accurate. I want to tell you it is. And not only is it accurate historically, not only is it, is it accurate um, uh, in, in, in its records, it's the Bible is scientifically accurate. Now, I believe this is an important one, so I'm going to spend most of the next uh, moments on this one. And so when you think it's okay, this is, uh, this is number two, and you realize there's not a lot of time. I'll try to shorten the others, but, the, but this one I think is, is a, for the simple reason there is just so much misunderstanding about science and the Bible. It is an important uh, topic that we look at it. Now, people who think that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate are usually the fact that they've never studied the Bible or they probably don't know science. Because God set up the laws of science. He set them up. He made them. He created them. He formed them. He instituted them, yes? Now, of course, the Bible isn't given to be a scientific textbook. You don't study the Bible to build a rocket, yes, and it doesn't use scientific language. But the Bible never gives bad science, not once in 1,600 years. In fact, it's always ahead of science. There are things in the Bible that have only been discovered in the last 100, 200, or 300 years ago. Johann Kepler, famous mathematician and astrologer, said, science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. In other words, God established the laws of physics, of biology, of mathematics, and then we discover them. You see, the Bible can be trusted because it is scientifically accurate. It's accurate because God created those laws, and truth never changes. Yes, but science is always changing, yes? Things that we thought were good for us before, now we know causes cancer. There were things that they said was good for a pregnant woman that they now say, stay away from. Science constantly changes. In fact, in Paris, in the Louvre, I can't pronounce French, so I need a French person to say the, the name of the art museum. It is a famous art museum and library, and one section has three and a half miles of obsolete science books. <laughs> three and a half miles of obsolete, why? Because you know when you do your science in, in school, and then if you went back to it, you'd find it's changed. In other words, there's not an obsolete science book is, is a waste of time. It's no good to us, is it? Because stuff that they thought was scientifically fact 1,500 years ago was disproven 1,000 years ago, or 700 years ago, 500 years, or whatever. In fact, some of the things that we thought 10 years ago have changed today. So this constantly, science is changing. And so we need to understand that. Now, if you had been reading the Bible 1,000 or 700 or 500 years ago, what the Bible had to say about some scientific things would not have agreed with the, the thinking of the day. That is profound, to think that actually the Bible is written by people who are living in their culture, and, they, and they, you would naturally use the science of the time, would you not? You would, know, you would use what you know, or what's the prevailing culture of the time. But God understands stuff even when we don't. 
And that's why we need to go by him. Psalm 148 says this, let everything create, every created thing, that's in other words, the whole universe, give praise to the Lord for he issued his command. In other words, his command, he set the rules in motion, the law of thermodynamics, the law of physics. And they came into being, he said. He established them forever and ever, and his orders will never be revoked. In 1861, a famous book called out 51 incontrovertible proofs that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. The only problem is today, uh, is today, well, in fact, 150 years later from that book being written, no scientist on the planet would believe any of those, hundred and, uh, those 51 um, incontrovertible proofs. That's how much things, science has moved on. But truth does not change. Now, <clears throat> one of the proofs that we know that this book is not simply man-made is not because of just what's in it, but because of what's not in it. Yes, because if this was a human book, you would expect it to be filled with the science facts of the prevailing day, but they're not in the book. For instance, for thousands and thousands of years, people believed that the earth was flat. It wasn't until Copernicus and Galileo and Columbus that people realized the world's not flat, that it's round, it's a sphere, it's a ball. But not a single verse in the Bible says that the Bible, that the world is flat. In fact, in Isaiah 40, verse 22, which is 2,600 years ago, yes, it says God is enthroned above the sphere on the earth. Are we not following, no? Is there not a... There we are. I think they've gone to sleep. God is enthroned above the sphere on the earth long before anybody knew it. Yes, this is what God wrote. So in other words, they're saying it's a sphere, and everybody else is saying it's flat. Yes? You see, when that was written, nobody believed it. But God said it was true, whether anybody believes it or not. For thousands of years, people believed that the earth was held up by something, depending on the culture you were in, depending on what you believed the earth was held up by. So, for example, in Greek culture, you believed that it was held up by a giant named Atlas. Part of the Bible, of course, is written in Greek, but Atlas isn't in the Bible. Why? Because it's not true. For thousands of years, the Hindus believed that the earth sat on the back of giant elephants, and when the elephants moved, that caused earthquakes. What did the elephants stand on? <laughs> I'm not making this up. They believed the giant elephant stood on the back of a giant sea turtle, which stood on the back of a giant sea serpent who swam through a cosmic sea. It's not in the Bible, even though the Bible was being written during this time. Why is it left out? Because the Bible leaves lies out. The Bible tells us that Moses was skilled and schooled in all of the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. Yes, he was adopted as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He knew with the best. I mean, they were brilliant, the Egyptians. They were absolutely unbelievable at their time. They were flat out brilliant. They built pyramids. They were masters of architecture, engineering and astronomy. But they were dead wrong at what, what held the earth up. Because ancient Egyptians believed that the earth was held up by five pillars. Yet not once in scripture do you find the earth is held up by five pillars. Why? Because it's not true. That's right. Yes. In fact, the old, oldest known writing to mankind is probably the book of Job. Job is the first book written. Yes, the Bible is not presented to us in a chronological order, but Job is the oldest book. So Job 26, verse 7, think about this, before all this other science stuff gets, God stretches the sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Yes, on nothing. Who told Job? This is what I'm trying to say. It's inspired, it's God-breathed. They spoke the words of God. It wasn't just men's words. Yes, they were doing that. I believe this is so important. For years, science believed that there was only about a thousand stars in the sky. 
and they could be counted, in fact, 150 years BC. A man named Hipparchus counted them and said there were 1,022 stars in the universe, and that was accepted for a long, long time. Until, of course, uh, a guy came 150 years, came 300 years later, should I say, 150 years AD, uh, kind of Ptolemy, t- um, says that there are 1,026. <laughs> he found four more stars. <laughs> Now they say that the stars in the sky are infinite. They can't be counted. They're more than the grains of the sand on the seashore. 2,600 years ago in Jeremiah 33 and verse 22, he said, the number of stars are infinite. Who's right? The Bible or science? I want to tell you, science is always trying to catch up with the Word of God. The Word is worth believing it is always true. We could do the same with biology and chemistry and medicine. For many years, people believed that too much blood in your body would make you sick. For thousands of years, this was the accepted custom, and they did what was called bloodletting. Yes, this is where doctors would cut the person and drain blood out of them, thinking that that would make them healthy. That was accepted science. Everybody knew it was true. It was because of Hippocrates um, that that this came. But for 2,000 years, they believed that all illness came from four bodily fluids. Yellow bile, black bile, red blood, or blue phlegm. Those four fluids also controlled your temperament. Now, nobody believes that anymore. Yeah? For 2,000 years, that was scientific proof. The first American, George Washington, was killed by his doctors doing this same procedure of bloodletting. He had a heart problem. So they bled George Washington, and he got worse, so they bled him again, and so he got worse, so they bled him again, until eventually he died. They killed him. Today, we know you give people blood when they're sick. We know the life source is in the blood, that good blood makes people feel better. That's where the life comes. It's called a transfusion. But they didn't know that for thousands of years. But the Bible knew it. The Bible knew it. Leviticus 17 and verse 11, God says this, the life of every creature is in its blood. How did Moses know that? Eh, We didn't even know that until around 1650. It wasn't until the 17th century when William Harvey discovered that blood circulates. Everybody bought into the Galilean Greek doctor who said for 2,000 years that the heart was just something that warmed us. It was a warming mechanism within us. Nobody knew that it actually pumped blood. But thousands of years ago, the Bible says the life of every creature is in its blood. During the Middle Ages, there was a bubonic plague, killed a quarter of Europeans. The thing is, we didn't understand about germs and contagion and infection and about the importance of quarantining people. So sick people with the bubonic plague were sleeping next to people who were healthy, and then they were catching it because it was infectious. But they should have read the Bible. Because if they'd read the Bible, they would have known in Leviticus 13 and verse 4, it says, put an infected person in quarantine for seven days. Thousands of years before we knew what germs were, they were already saying, you're infected, you go out the camp for seven days so you don't infect anybody else. And then if they came back and they were still infected, guess what they did? Sent them back for another seven days. So in other words... He's understanding nobody understood quarantine. But I want to tell you that the Bible, when it does talk about things, is always accurate. It is always ahead of science. And the reason for that is what's spoken in Proverbs 13, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. Amen. Yes, mine aren't, yours aren't, but every word of God is flawless. Psalm 12, verse 6 says this, The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay and purified seven times. Now, unfortunately, my mouth gets into gear before my mind mind is engaged and knows what is going on, and so I say stupid things, and we all do. But God doesn't. God never says one single word that's wrong. 
He, 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 he can't say a wrong word. It's in him to be constantly right. Yes? So we know that we can trust the Bible because it is historically accurate, it is archaeologically confirms it, and it is scientifically accurate. And we know we can trust the Bible because it is prophetically accurate. What does that mean? It means that the predictions in the Bible about something that's going to happen at a certain point in time to someone or to a people or wherever, uh, that they predicted ahead of time, they come true. That's what predictions and prophecy means. And so the Bible is filled with thousands of prophecies. Thousands of them, yes. It's not just a one-off, oh, we got one and we got it right. Do you know what I mean? Oh, we got a dozen and we got it right. Yes, it's not. Many have already been fulfilled of these, pro- uh, these um, uh, prophecies. And, um, and yeah, I'm sure you book after book of, of these things uh, that have been fulfilled exactly as God said they would be. But of course, there are still some that need to be fulfilled, and we're looking for their fulfillment in the coming again of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. And there things in and that's why we know that they are going to happen as an uncertainty, because everything else that the Bible has said is true. It's all true. Yes. There are over three hundred prophecies in the Bible about Jesus. Yes, a thousands of years before he was born, over a thousand year period. This is when he'll be born. This is where he'll be born. This is how he'll be born. Yeah, you can't control that. You can't control being born of a virgin. You can't control where your parents will conceive you. You can't control who your parents will be. And yet it was all spoken of beforehand in the word of God, how the Messiah would come. Let me ask you, you mathematicians, what are the odds of 300 prophecies like this coming to pass? I want to tell you, you couldn't write it down. It is so, so big. It's kind of just, uh, if I remember rightly, I think about um, a a certain percentage of them, I think it was about 50 or something of them coming, was 10 to the power of 157. So in other words, it doesn't happen every day. And so you've got a thousand years before Jesus came and died on the cross. David, in one of his Psalms, describes what death by crucifixion is like. Now, he doesn't use the word crucifixion, but before the Romans had even thought up crucifixion, David is describing death by crucifixion, what it was like. Now, only God could have told him that because he'd never seen crucifixion. They didn't know what it was. But it says this in 2 Peter. It says, no prophecy ever originated from humans. Instead, it was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's direction. Yes, In other words, what we're trying to say is, it was God-breathed. Yeah. Now, during Bible times, I want you to think about this with prophecy, nobody wanted to be a prophet. Now, let me explain the reason for that, is because we get a lot of people wanting to be prophets these days, and we get them, and and you kind of think, oh, you know, for for many of them, you just kind of think to yourself, uh, I wish that they would not say what they're going to say, because you can guarantee most of what they say is not going to come uh, come, come to pass for, for many of them. There are prophets, there are false prophets, and there are non-prophets. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. Anyway, <clears throat> um, nobody wanted to fight. Why? For the simple reason a prophet had to be accurate 100% of the time. If he got one wrong, he was immediately seen as a false prophet and would be stoned to death. So let me ask you in the room, who wants to be a prophet? <laughs> Is there anybody in the house who would like to be a prophet? Yes. I want to tell you, there's, there's, uh, we need that. But Matthew 26 says, but this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in Scripture. In other words, Jesus said it's all coming true just like God predicted. Revelations 22, John said this, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and they're true. Why? Because they're coming from God. The Lord sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. It is prophetically accurate. Fourthly, yes, it is thematically unified. It has the same theme all through the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus 
is at the center. He's the star of the show. It is all about Jesus. A lot of books carry the same theme from beginning to end. That's nothing new and that's nothing brilliant, especially when it's written by the same author. Yes, but this is written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors in three different continents, in three different languages. How do you think they came up with the same story? It wasn't even collected into one book until a 1,000 years later after everyone had died. It is one thing if one person wrote the book. The, Quor the Quran, for example, was written by one person, Muhammad. The Analects of Confucian were written by Confucius. And the writings of Buddha were written by Buddha. You would expect them to have some kind of uniform at T through A. But the Bible was written by poets and prophets, princes and kings, sailors and soldiers, attorneys and a doctor, prisoners, common people, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars and businessmen. All kinds of people wrote the Bible, written in all types of, uh, of locations, in caves and ships, in homes, in palaces, in prisons. And yet it all has the same theme of redemption, of salvation from cover to cover. God he's surely trying to tell us in this place today that he has a plan and he knows what he is doing Jesus said in Luke 24 beginning with Moses that's the first five books of the Bible and all the prophets as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and so on Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself Many people think the New Testament is about Jesus and the Old Testament is about Israel. No, 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 no. The whole of the Bible is about Jesus. From the beginning, it is about Jesus, yes? The pictures, the metaphors, the analogy, the analogies, the illusions, everything in Scripture from beginning to end is about God's plan to redeem his people and build a family for eternity. It all began with him. The star of the story is Jesus, and you can see him every book. John 5, 39 says, you search the scriptures because you believe they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Fifthly, the fifth way I can trust the Bible is because it's confirmed by Jesus. Jesus trusted the Bible. So if you trust in Jesus, you've got to trust the Bible. Jesus proclaimed the Bible as a unique book above all others. Matthew 5, 18 says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. John 10, 35, Jesus said, Scripture is always truth. So Jesus proclaimed that. He said it's life-changing is the word of God. Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said this, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Not read it like poetry, not read it like a, an history book, not read it like it's just some stories, but read it like it's true and obey it because God wrote it. Jesus believed in the prophets. He talked about Daniel and Noah in the flood. He talked about Adam and Eve. He spoke about the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah and he spoke about Jonah. What I find interesting is the most disputed people that are disputed in the Bible are these guys, Noah, Adam and Eve, Sodom and Gomorrah, Jonah, are the most disputed stories in the Bible. But Jesus believed them. Augustine said this, if in the Bible you believe what you like and you don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible you trust, but yourself. And the sixth reason that you can trust the Bible as the absolute word of God is it has survived all attacks. That makes it an unusual book. The Bible is the most despised book in history, the most derided book in history, the most denied book, the most disputed, the most dissected, the most debated, the most outlawed, the most destroyed, and the most banned book in all of history. And yet millions of people have died because they will not give up the book. Yes, it is still today illegal in many countries around the world. You can't take a Bible into North Korea. You will get killed for it. And the Bible has been under attack every century. And yet it is still the most read, the most published, the most translated, and the best-selling book, best book in the world.
The Bible is the greatest single source of music. The Bible is the greatest single source of art. It is the, mo the, the single uh, greatest source of architecture throughout history. We speak the English language because of the King James Version. Because that was written, we, we speak, and that's how we spoke the language. Matthew 24 and verse 35 says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I want to tell you it's the only thing on the planet that is going to last forever. And all of us, of course, who have given our life to Jesus. I think it is interesting, Voltaire, the famous French philosopher, he was a brilliant man, but he was an atheist. And he declared, and he wrote lots of tracts trying to disprove the Bible and that it was a waste of time and it was wrong and this, that, and the other. I want to tell you, 50 years after his death, the very place where he printed tracts to dispute the Bible, it was used to print the Bible. Yes, the Bible Society um, took it on for nearly 100 years, the French Bible Society. They sold Bibles out of his house. It's now a museum. You see, people have forgotten about Voltaire, but they've not forgotten about God's Bible. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. The grass withers and the flowers fail, says Peter. Temporary stuff wilts. Today's news is worthless tomorrow. I don't read last week's newspaper. The temporary stuff doesn't last. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of God stands forever. Isn't that fantastic? You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm not sure whether or not I believe this stuff. But it is important that we take our time to actually look at it. Seventhly, it has, and I think this is one that's the most exciting, it has transforming power. Nothing can change a life like the Bible. It's changed your life, it's changed my life. Tens of thousands, in fact, millions of people throughout the earth, their lives have been changed because of the Bible. I've seen flat-out drunks, irresponsible addicts, get their life clean and sober because they start reading the Bible. I've seen the most self-centered, narcissistic men who abuse and misuse women and would rip off anybody to make themselves feel better, read the Bible, have their lives transformed and become godly husbands, wonderful dads and upstanding citizens in the community. You can't change human behavior by laws. Our politicians, whatever laws they bring, are not going to change people's behavior because it needs a change of heart. And it, the Bible changes our heart. And that's what really matters, is changing our heart. God has got to change our heart. And so <clears throat> John 8 says this, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I don't know, but many secular universities around the world have that, uh, that part, the second half of the verse, printed up uh, somewhere on their buildings. Yes, the truth will make you free. But of course, they ignore God, ignore the Bible, and they forget the first part of the verse, which says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's a, there's a continuing in his word. I want to guarantee you this book will never lie to you. Yeah, even if you don't like what in it, what's in it, even if you don't agree with it, even if it hurts and you feel uncomfortable, I want to tell you it is the Bible and it is the Holy Bible for a reason. Let me ask you, do you believe everything that you read online? Do you believe everything that you read in the newspapers? Do you believe everything that's on TV and the news on TV? Depends which channel, you get a different slant, don't you? Why do we spend so much time reading, watching, looking, listening to things that are going to be of no use tomorrow, that are not feeding our souls, that are not life-changing, when we have the life-changing, transforming, uh, uh, imperishable seed of the Word of God? that we can take every day, that can nourish us and nourish our mind, nourish our heart, nourish our spirit, nourish every part of us. 
The most important question that we can ask in our life is what is going to be the ultimate authority in our life? Who are we going to listen to? Who has authority? Is it you that has the ultimate authority in your life? Is it someone else? Is it your parents? Is it your friends? Is it your sister? Or is it God? You have to decide whether it's the word or the world. You see, the reason why people don't accept the word of God is because they want to be boss. For those of you that maybe still want to to be boss in your life, let me ask you, how's it going? Because things aren't going well when you're the boss. But when you put God as the center, it changes everything. It changes your life. It changes your perspective. Because you've got to get this book into you. You've got to get the word of God because it is God-breathed. It has a purpose for your life. It it explains your purpose for life. It unpacks your purpose for life. You can't know your identity. You can't know who you are. You can't know how you fit into the cosmic um, plan of God until you start to read the word of God. Romans 12 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. In other words, the way it thinks, the way its worldviews happens, you know, Um, this whole thing now, the uh, uh, critical theory stuff that's coming in, that's giving us some weird stuff now. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can either be a conformist or a transformist. The choice is yours. Are you going to conform to the world, conform to what other people want you to be, or are you going to be transformed by the word of God? You see, God's plan for your life It says there, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God's plan for your life is good, it's perfect, and it's pleasing. But you're only going to know that as you read the word of God. Amen.